Well, none of us needed another event in our lives that would make us say, we all remember where we were when that happened, but we got one this week. With Bill Whittle and Stephen Green, I'm Scott Ott. This episode of Right Angles brought to you by the members at BillWhittle.com. And gentlemen, we're going to just have kind of a loose conversation about the events of this week, uh, including the assassination attempt on former President Donald Trump, as well as uh, the Republican convention, the vice presidential pick uh, for the president, the reaction of the uh, sitting president um, in the White House, and anything else that comes to our minds. I think some of our viewers just need to um, work through the details in their heads. And honestly, I'll, I'll kick off by saying a lot of my feelings about everything are still kind of muddled. Um, there's so much yeah. that happened and there are so many questions that still remain and so many concerns uh, that this is, not, um, this is not a history book. This is a snapshot as it happens, so to speak, uh, in time. So years later, when people watch this video, they will see us probably just kind of grappling with something that they know a lot more about in the future than we did. Um, Stephen Green, I was at my full-time job uh, when the text came from Bill to the two of us um, with the picture of President Trump with blood streaking across his face, swarmed by Secret Service agents with a flag in the background. And I did not at that point know what had happened um, and so for there was a moment of disorientation for me of, of just wondering what's going on here. Um, how did the news come to you and, and what was your immediate thought and reaction? Uh, the same way it comes to so many people now uh, through Twitter or X, I guess I should say. Um, totally different from when Reagan was shot in 1981. Um, and by the way, I was born in 1969. So to me, the, you know, where were you when JFK was shot? That's a question you ask of old people. And well, now I'm, I'm one of the old people talking about yeah. Reagan 43 years ago. Um, I was, I was in elementary school. I was in sixth grade and one of the kindergartners, and you can't trust kindergartners. Uh, this little kindergartner, I'm walking past him in the hall, says the president was shot. I'm like, no way. And then I walked into social studies class where the teacher was wheeling in the giant TV. Well, I mean, it only had a 19-inch screen, but the thing was massive. Wheeling in the TV cart and plugging it in so we could all watch the, the news about the assassination. Uh, this time, of course, I found out on on Twitter. I happened to be sitting at my desk. I was fiddling with my music library, as I, as I like to do. And... Um, I was just getting ready to, to head downstairs and join my wife for the evening when I pulled up Twitter for a moment, and there it is. Just it, it had happened literally moments ago, and my first thought was, "It's just like the, that kindergartner. I'm, I'm going to see it. I'm not going to believe it for a moment." And then I I dug in a little bit, and sure enough, he was shot. He was he, he seemed to be okay. And then the next thought is, "Okay, uh, I have to go tell my wife and kids. Uh, I've got uh, two sons, 18 and 14." How do you do this? And you don't just go racing down the stairs going, like, God damn it, somebody shot the president. I walked downstairs and said, the pre or the, I said, uh, Trump is fine, but he was shot at by an assassin. They saw blood on him, but he looked strong and defiant, and they say he's okay. And that's all we know by now, or at, at this time. And... My 18-year-old looked up from his phone, AirPods in, of course, and said, yeah, I know, because this is, this is how we all find out now. I, um, I was, uh, our friend, a friend of mine, Clay Bradley, told me, texted me about it, and when I turned on the news, uh, the first thing I saw was um, just the empty podium and a pile of Secret Service agents and uh, yeah. no sign of Donald Trump. And then it, almost the second I tuned in, I heard I heard Trump's voice, which is so, you know, easily identifiable, yeah. saying, "Wait, wait, let me get my shoes. Let me get my shoes." And I remember thinking, "That's a good sign. Um, that that's not something I would be saying if I had been, you know, critically hit." And then uh, then he he kind of got up, and you could hear them because the mic was still hot, and you could hear them talking about whether or not they, it was safe to get him into the into the uh, limousine, the Beast. 
And and he and then I remember him saying, "Wait a minute!" Then then he popped his head out from this protective turtle shell that had been built around him, iconic, and put his fist in the air and just and just started saying, "Fight, fight!" I didn't know what he was saying, frankly. I didn't know he was saying, "Fight, fight, fight!" until afterwards. But it was pretty clear he was shaking his fist at whoever you know just shot at him. And I thought, you know, the it takes enormous moral courage to make yourself a target. But when but when the gunfire actually happens. That's when you find out what you're actually made out of, and and for his first instinct to be to emerge from from protective cover, and show show his supporters and his followers that he's all right, but also to show the the person that shot at him and everybody who who wanted to take a shot. He showed at him, the world. You know, he he showed Putin. Yeah, he, he showed, showed the world. Z. Yeah. And the second I heard that or, or saw that, I I immediately said to myself, "This is a historic moment." Obviously, it's historic because of the assassination, but but. But historic in a in a way that, like for instance, I remember I was where I was when I heard that Princess Diana was killed. But this was this was more history shaking than just like a, a milestone. The, my first thought was this is Yeltsin on the tank. This is the guy standing in front of the tanks in Tiananmen Square. This is you know this is George uh, George Bush on the on the rubble heap with the bolt with the uh, the the the, um, the megaphone and. Um, and I was so impressed by it. I was as proud as what I was. Yeah. Actually, I was I was really proud of him. And um, and it, it and it's funny because you know we we have all had and and I think this is true for most Trump supporters to various degrees. It's not like we're immune to or unaware of the man's faults. And some of us uh, some of us weigh his faults more heavily than others. But I just remember thinking, I've I've just come to love this guy, you know. And now I really I just I just I love him in the way that 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 English people love Churchill, who did exactly the same thing when when chips were at their lowest. You know that that's when you really find out about a person's character is is right at the moment of crisis. That's when you'll really know what kind of person they are. And for him to just get up and say fight with blood streak down his his face. He's not. By the way, when he when he says, "Wait a minute," and pops his head up and, and sticks his fist he, in the air, he he doesn't know if there's other shooters out there. He he doesn't he doesn't know any of that. Yeah, the Secret Service he's, he's, had already said to him and in that pot, well, to the to themselves, shooter the shooters down. down. But you're right; they didn't know if it a was shooter's a solo down. Shooter, yeah. Right, and and so he did that. And then the other thing I I noticed because I'm I'm really soaking up details when when things like this happen, my my recorders go, the tapes go to high speed, you know, they start recording like a higher data rate and I'm just catching all of these details. And I noticed that when they're, when they're walking him out to the limousine, I remember this because I'm 10 years older than Steve is. I remember clearly when they put Reagan in the limousine, the Secret Service, you push him down and in. Yeah. You, yeah. you don't invite them to sit down. You push them face first down and in. And, and they went to push Trump face first down and in, and he and I could see him pushing back against them. Yeah. And one more time, he got up on the running board, stuck his head up, make itself a perfect target, you know, and just just one more. Um, I'm okay. They missed me. They didn't get me. And then in he goes, and and I that's, thought it, it's not just courage; it's leadership. It's lead. That's exactly right. It's leadership. Yeah, Reagan had been pushed and, down, and a Secret Service agent jumped on top of him and actually hurt him. Um, yeah, when, uh, when he hit uh, the floor. cracked a rib or two, if I remember yeah. correctly. Uh, the one thing I wanted to uh, say about the comparison between the two assassination attempts is we didn't find out until much later how close Reagan came to dying yeah. on that operating yes. table. Yeah. And Trump came much closer to dying than it appeared at first from the yeah. video that we all saw, because had he not turned his head when he turned his head, um, the audience behind him would have been sprayed with Trump brains. No exaggeration. I'll tell you something else, that, something that really, really quite, the, the thing that actually viscerally shocked me the most, and I'm, I don't know how else to explain this, is when somebody said it, the last time this had happened had been 43 years ago. I said, that can't yeah, possibly yeah. be right. That can't possibly it's be right. It's the memory is been, so fresh. How many, well, it's just that it just seems to me that there must have been assassination attempts on every president, but no, we'd gone yeah. we'd gone a, a, a half a lifetime yeah. without anybody taking a shot at a president, and it bears mentioning that you know that nobody took a shot at Obama during his two terms, no one took a shot at at, at Bill Clinton during his two terms. Somebody threw a shoe, a shoe at George W. Bush, but he I was, was about to bring widely that up. 
widely reviled figure. Um, and, and, and and can I use that as a jumping off point for a conversation please. about this? Yeah. Because a lot of the, uh, the immediate punditry jump to this idea, the, the word rhetoric all of a sudden became uh, like every other sentence in everything I heard. It was like, you know, the, 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 the level of our discourse, our rhetoric, our, dis, our public division and stuff like that. And I just thought, holy cow, you got one guy out of 331 million people for the first time in 40 exactly. some years who takes a shot at a president and all of a sudden this is the symptom that we have a problem with rhetoric in this country, um, you know, or, but really they just were going to a pre-existing narrative that they think we have a, uh, this problem and piling on that. And then the other thing that struck me guys was uh, how often the TV journalists especially seemed reluctant to say what was obvious to our eyes yes. and seemed to say things that were contrary to what we saw. Like I, I heard multiple accounts that described yeah. the president as collapsing beneath the podium. To me, <laughs> the first time I saw it, he he reaches he up ducked. he reaches up to his ear, looks at his hand, and then he ducks down behind the podium. The natural Quickly. smart thing to do. Yes. yes. As a, as somebody who's cur- who is conscious, aware of what he's doing, he did not fall down. He got down, and he did exactly what you should do in that kind of situation when he saw that Which he had they blood probably on. drill candidates on, by the way. But he probably, you know, when he when you first hear that noise, you're not thinking, "Hey, somebody's going to shoot me today." You're not prepared. Yeah, you're not prepared. And then for this. even looking at your hand with blood on it, there's got to be some disconnect for him going, "Whoa, what the heck's that?" Um, you know, and then for him to get down, that was the heads up thing to do, so to speak, is to duck his head. Um, and get under there. And then the Secret Service, you know, did their job of turtling him, basically, got, c- forming this human dome over him. But the the reports were constantly kind of misinterpreting or misstating. Like, And I, I heard an account from one journalist who said uh, his editor was saying, hey, we're not ready to go with the accusation that he was shot. And that's what caused the injury because we don't know that yet. And I'm like... And a, and a lot of people were saying... A lot of, and, and you still see this a lot. I mean, it's it's not so much anymore. It's been a couple of days now, but the echo during the day after and it's fading was that no, he wasn't shot. He was just hit by by pieces of flying glass from a teleprompter, as if that's okay, you know? Yeah, yeah. As if as if a bullet yeah, yeah. hits a teleprompter and he wasn't actually hit by a bullet. He was only hit by flying gl- glass from the bullet that went through the teleprompter that was aimed. Well, one of the shells there. didn't ki- didn't kill the soldier. It was uh, the foxhole collapsing on him. The guy who caught right. the picture of the bullet that was the New York of Times. The bullet. Uh, I think his name is Doug Mills. Oh, that caught the picture of the bullet in flight. He's using like this super high speed shutter speed because of it, it was a really bright day and he's shooting up basically into the sky into from the, sky, the front right. foot yeah. of the stage. So he catches this picture and his editors are like, "Oh, we're not really we're not really ready to go with the story that he was shot. It might have been the teleprompter." And he was like, "No, I've got pictures of the teleprompters." <laughs> You know, there's no holes in the yeah, teleprompter. Yeah, the teleprompters are fine. It's it's the former president we need to be concerned about. But no, it was a one in a million shot. And, and, and I'm not. And I, I, I saw, don't mean to say that there's some sort of weird conspiracy where all the journalists said, "Hey, let's get together and say this." But it was like they couldn't process it either. You know, and and they were just. I like, processed it. But they had they had a template as we all do in our minds of like of trying. To, they're trying to plug this into something they know. And so, like, okay, See, well, I think he's they're an old guy. Plug, he I, fell down, but he didn't. I think they're trying to plug it into 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 something like, what is the most immediate thing we can say that doesn't benefit Trump? Yeah, I mean, or, because or anybody who's get his because, nasty supporters all riled up. Because anybody who saw that, there's not a single person who saw that happen who didn't know immediately exactly what was going on. Yeah. And for the news to say Trump stumbles, Trump falls, you loud know, popping uh, Trump, noises. Remo- yeah, loud popping noises. I, I was watching uh, Fox Live, and and the host there, who I don't understand how she <clears throat> how she got her job. To be perfectly honest with you, but somebody, but but after six or seven minutes or eight or nine minutes of coverage, she says, "People are saying this might be an assassination attempt." And I thought, "Wow, genius! Yeah, you are right on the ball here." <coughs> yeah, Fox, anyway, Fox so is going way downhill. It's just another lesson to say in the immediate aftermath of any event, don't believe about 90% of what you hear and uh, and be careful about what you think you see too. Because I, I also noticed that people who agreed with me on most of things in life immediately jumped to conclusions about causation 
and about motivations and about all kinds of things that they really didn't know anything about. Yeah. And they seemed a little disturbed with me of saying, well, let's see what the facts say as they come in. I don't have to make a decision about this right now. It's not going to affect national policy for me to come to a snap judgment. Let's see what the facts say. Yeah, um, I, uh, I I started to get on Twitter to say something witty or stupid or jerky or whatever. And then I said, no, going to follow the 24-hour rule. I posted a little yeah. thing. I deleted it and said, nope, going to wait 24 hours. But now that it's been just shy of three days, uh, let me let me give you my initial impressions. And keep in mind, these are initial impressions based on very little factual information that where are, we are, now, are yeah. subject to change. On the morning of the 16th of July, by the yeah. way. Yeah. <laughs> so my impression of the shooter, this, this Crooks kid, I believe is his last name, yeah? Uh, yeah. 20 years old. He seems more like the John Hinckley type assassin who's working out his personal inadequacies in the most violent, awful public way possible, and not a politically motivated assassin like, say, a, a John Wilkes Booth. Um, that said, and again, this is initial impression. I'm I'm more than willing to change it as as data comes in. I I, I can't help but think that eight years of rhetoric like literally Hitler will end democracy, will hurt America, all of this stuff may very well have helped Crooks to narrow down his target list to a particular person. So I'll tell you where I disagree with that, uh, because he lived about 40 miles away or 80 miles away, something, right? He was relatively Something like that, yeah. It may, yeah, it may have been a target of convenience. I'm absolutely yeah, he, he willing was, to... Well, he was yeah. from Bethel Park. I'm, the event happened in Butler. I've been, I've been to Butler, Pennsylvania, um, and I had some friends from Bethel Park when I was in college. So, you know, they're, they're kind of in the greater Pittsburgh area. Okay, so uh, I'm one of the uh, few remaining people who, who has become convinced by evidence and presented in a book called uh, Case Closed by Gerald Posner that uh, John F. Kennedy was, was shot by Lee Harvey Oswald acting alone. Uh, and I think the evidence for that yeah. is overwhelming. If you read that book and you come out of that with a different opinion, then I'd love to have a discussion with you. But you got to read that book yeah. first. And but agreed. By but the what way. you find, yeah. but what you find about about the the Kennedy assassination was, you've got Lee Harvey Oswald, who who by the way never is never mentioned in any of these conspiracy theories. He's just oh he's the patsy. It's yeah. Like, well, can we learn a little bit about the guy? Yeah. You know, he defected to the Soviet Union, came back, you know, attention hound, you know, down on his, his wife was leaving him in a state of utter despair. And Lee Harvey Oswald got a job at the Texas Book Depository, I want to say something like four or five weeks before the parade route was announced. And all of a sudden, you've got this unstable guy that. who reads the papers, who finds out that the president of the United States is going to be going past his front door. And, and so now he's got... An opportunity, and and when I found out that this guy had no, at least as, as we sit here on the sixteenth, no apparent political axe to grind, it struck me as as very similar to that where the guy found himself. Hey, the president's going to be speaking at open air event, you know, th thirty miles away from me. This is an opportunity that uh, I'm not likely to see again, for whatever insane reasons he, he he might have had in mind you know you you got to ask yourself in the era of 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 mass school shootings all, all of these school shootings are suicide by cop there's almost none of these n almost none of these shooters expect to get out of there alive and so it's like if you're going to commit suicide and there's a lot of suicidal teens out there and if you're going to commit suicide and you're a certain kind of person who's angry at the world you go shoot up a school you get to commit suicide by cop and, and you get to be famous and you get to air all your grievances and you're no, known around the world and all the rest of it. I'm, I'm, my initial impression is that this seems like that same general kind of psychological uh, motivation because after – it's been a couple days – no one has been able to find anything about this kid that makes – it's not like he was an Antifa leader or – you know, or a, There's no manifesto you know, essentially. Correct, and there, and there, and there, and there doesn't seem to be much, so far. Again, yeah. we might discover an entire treasure trove, but at the moment, there doesn't seem to be any real uh, political uh, activism on the yeah. on the part he, of this kid. He seems like a Hinckley type, as as I said. He's, he's so so. And by the way, Hinckley pursued Carter, got within twenty yeah. feet of him, and didn't shoot. And so so, it, it's almost like a target of opportunity for a certain kind of person who's 
who's out there, you know, either thinking about doing something to themselves or or whatever, and all of a sudden this 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 like this this beam comes down and says you uh, have a chance to have a rendezvous with uh, history in your own perverted, demented, straight bound to hell kind of way. And that would be my first initial take on it. It's not what I expected to see. And I don't know how else to say this other than to say on some level, having just had this discussion with you two guys, I'm a bit relieved, you know? Uh, I'm a bit relieved that this wasn't a, a, a highly mot- a, 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 again with all the caveats of where we are in time and space and all the rest of that stuff, right? But I'm a bit relieved that it was uh, stumbling onto one of those broken people, rather than you know a a politically motivated uh, attack. Now a lot of people are going to say, well, you you know you're just completely naive. The guy was a was a patsy or is a setup or whatever. And maybe he is. Who knows? But. There doesn't seem to be any evidence of that at the moment, but we got a lot to talk about when it comes to Secret Service. The Secret and Service. Well, and thank like you that. for mentioning that. Good Lord. Sorry, There's Scott. Part of the Go challenge. Ahead. No, no, that's okay. I was going to say part of the challenge, and this is kind of an overall caveat from my perspective, is that we are so early in the process. We have so little information, and people's brains don't like to to stay in a state of suspended animation. People's brains like decisions. to draw conclusions, and so yep. uh, within minutes of my some of my colleagues at work finding out about it and some customers at work finding out about it, they immediately began spouting their conclusions about an event about which they knew literally nothing. Well, we've all <laughs> and, been steeped in six and, decades of conspiracy yes. theories on, on JFK and then the fake moon landings and all the rest. It's it's almost like it's built into our culture now, this this assumption of conspiracy. Yeah, and one of my me, one of my friends I... said something about. Oh, I think it was I think it was staged, and I said, "Yeah, I think they staged it on the same sound stage where they did the moon landing." You know, it was just like <laughs> and I texted Scott. Scott texted us that, and I said, I, I, for, when, "When I heard you told that guy, uh, if you need a kid, me just let me know." That that to me is just like, well. In, the in any case, that said, uh, oh, it's just, I know yeah. it's 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 impossible to keep commenters from running amok with their latest theory and. The Chatterverse is filled with all kinds of, you know, nonsense, including this new category of of uh, conspiracy theorists that I hadn't previously heard about called the Blue Anons. This is the uh, oh, leftist yeah. version of QAnon. <laughs> so, they, they've been around a while. Yeah, well, I didn't Ugh. know about it until this because I don't generally go down those rabbit holes. But um, so, so all of that said, uh, like I, in general, I try to reserve myself to what I can say with some level of confidence based on facts that we already have. And frankly, you know, we don't know much about this kid. We, you know, we know where he worked. We know where he graduated. He graduated. He got a prize for math and and He was apparently a bright kid, right? A real yeah. bright kid. So, uh, you know, lived in a suburban area. Nice. Uh, the Bethel Park is actually, my understanding, is a pretty, pretty nice area. Um, was obviously an accomplished marksman, used to go regularly shooting, um, and... Um, now that I didn't know. Uh, 125 well, yards with, with a properly no, but, but sighted he had, rifle he had, is not that difficult but, to hold shot. Hold on, I, this, this is not, the first I've heard it's of. Not, it's not that At difficult all. to this shot had, if you're used to shooting. But if you're not hold on, somebody so who he, shoots yeah. on a somewhat regular basis, you don't just this is news climb up me. on a roof and pop off a shot at 130 yards. That's I thought the guy missed. Be, I thought the guy missed because it was some. My first take was that the guy missed because it was some Antifa radical or something, and he went out and got his rifle for the first time. This guy had had a history. No, of, I think of, he of, of shooting. I think he recreationally, like I think he went to the range. Like his dad thought he was at the range. Okay, you know, so he's been so he he knows his firearms. Yeah. is all I'm yeah, saying. Just so he, just to give it, you an he idea, has some understanding of how to to use firearms. He he didn't I, just I, walk into a gun store or steal his dad's gun and he didn't know anything about it. He knew. I did how not to use know it, that. You know. But but let me let me let me give a little extra perspective. I've never been, or at least not until recent years, have I been much of a rifle shooter. In fact, at all, I was always a pistol guy. Didn't care for uh, for rifles at all. Just wasn't my thing. So I was I wasn't a hunter. Pistols and targets that that was fun to me. Um, and I hadn't shot a rifle literally in years. I go to the range with my dear friend, Ed, who was, he, he passed away a couple of years ago. He was a, a, a big time uh, deer and, and elk hunter. And Ed says, come on, I, I brought something pretty. Let's, let's, let's go to the hundred yard range. And me firing a rifle at a distance of a hundred yards that I hadn't fired probably ever. And again, I hadn't fired a rifle seriously in, in years. Um, Ed helped get me set up, points me at the target, 
I squeeze off my first round and I'm two inches low of the bullseye. And I'm like, oh man, I thought I was right on it. And Ed, Ed's got his, his his spotting scope and he goes, oh yeah, I've actually got this uh, sighted in for whatever the actual distance was. He said, just, just aim high two inches and you'll be fine. Guess what? Second pull of the trigger, squeeze of the trigger, excuse me, boom, bullseye. Uh, a properly sighted rifle with somebody who's just even basically competent yeah, they yeah. are now, crazy accurate. Now, I will it, say, did though, he have sights, Steve, by the way? You're, you have, you're with a optics? friend shooting at a piece oh, yeah, of paper. Oh, yeah, shooting with a scope. You're, you're with a friend shooting at a piece of paper. You're not laying on a hot metal roof sure. in front of a crowd of sure. thousands of people but shooting this, at, the, at the former president of the United States. So I'm, but I'm you just talk saying— But you talk to any hunter, and they will tell you the same story. If you've got, if you've got basic training and—not basic Army training, but if you've got some, some good training and a, a well-sighted-in rifle, that is a gimme shot. Did did he have optics? Does yeah, anybody? Uh, well, that's up to debate. Him? Nobody can seem to tell. Yeah. Now again, okay. I just so I don't get misunderstood. My position isn't yeah. that it's a difficult shot for somebody who knows how to shoot a gun. It's that this guy yeah. didn't just grab his dad's gun with which he was unfamiliar oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and climb up onto a roof. He knew how to shoot that's a gun. That's news to me. And it seems because you, all three of us have fired firearms and have some experience with that at different levels. We think it's a natural thing. For people who don't use firearms, it's a freakish alien thing, and they wouldn't know <laughs> they wouldn't know which end to point at the target in many cases. So you've got to you've got to you know realize that this this kid. I mean, it's and it's it's Pennsylvania. It's you know it's Western Pennsylvania. A lot of people. You know, when I drove through Dealey Plaza a couple of years ago in Dallas, I was stunned at how close the book depository was to where the, the Kennedy vehicle had been, the presidential yep. limousine had been. And my I literally said to my wife, or I, I think you were with me, Bill, but at, at this point I said, wow, most kids I knew in high school could have made that shot, you know, yeah. it, of a moving object because they they were yeah. deer hunters. And the car had, well, yeah, we don't need to get yeah. into the Kennedy thing. But anyway, so, um, but that's and, and all, Trump all of was this. not a moving object except for turning yeah. his head a little bit. Okay, Praise so God let's talk that. about the yeah. the real elephant, right? And that is that that there are I, I've seen synchronized video that show at least one minute and forty seven seconds of people pointing to the guy on the roof, trying to get the attention of the police, shouting and yelling yes. that there's a guy with a gun on top of a of, of a the, the closest possible building. This wasn't seventeen roofs back, you yeah. know. I mean, this was this was the the, the, the it was question a few now feet. is. This is either such gross incompetence or it's collusion. And and the collusion word makes me ill. So I'm going to go with I'm going to go with the incompetence thing, but there are still many other things that are associated with this. There are reports that his secret service detail was weakened because Joe Biden needed some secret service protection that was apparently sent to some event that she was doing. How much of so this is rumor? Secretary Mayorkas said it's number 1 he said it's a failure. Um, and, and number two, he said there was no shortage of resources there. Um, what I've read from well, Secret except Service- Except apparently some of them were uh, seconded from Homeland Security because they didn't have enough Secret Service. What I've, what I've read from Secret Service sources said, typically the Secret Service covers um, directly, like obviously right around the president and in kind of a secondary perimeter. The wider perimeter is usually covered by local law enforcement on events yeah. like this. And in fact, local law enforcement was using that building as a staging area, but they were inside the building. <laughs> For crying out loud, yeah. So, they're, so the local police are in the building while the guy is climbing up on top of the building. And one, uh, I saw an interview, I believe it was with a, a sheriff or a local police chief, and he said one of his guys responding to people in the crowd who said there's a guy up there, climbed up, pulled himself up uh, above the, the, the line of the roof, and, and the shooter turned on him as if to point the gun at him or actually pointed the gun at him, at which point this guy kind of lost his grip and fell down. Has this um, story been confirmed? Because I've only seen it one place. The, the place I saw it was coming out of the mouth of a guy wearing a police uniform who said that his guy told him that. <laughs> So, okay. Wow. Um, I forget yeah. the name of the guy, but I was watching a video of this police officer who said that this is this is what his guy told him. 
Um, See, if I get if I'm on a roof and I'm looking for a sniper, and a guy with a gun points a gun at me, and I fall off the roof, the first thing that I'm going to shout is "ow," and the second thing I'm going to shout is "sniper on the roof." Yeah. Or, I shout "gun," and everybody snaps into action. The Secret Service hears "gun," and whoop, the president's whisked away. And it's that's, hard to that's, tell. That's, that's, so their, why, that's their code red word. It's hard to tell who knew what exactly when, because what we see as images, as you've talked about before, Bill, we've got a we've got a frame around what we can see, but we don't yeah. see everything that's happening or hear everything that's happening. So we don't know what the radio traffic exactly was saying. We're not sure what the snipers who were basically on the other side of the stage were hearing. Um, they clearly, within a, a moments of when that guy popped off his first shots, they dispatched him rapidly. Boom. Um, yeah, and yes, but the but we have video. We have video of them too, and what seems to be pretty clear is that is that the the sniper and the guy who's lying prone see something, lean into it, look like they're about to take a shot, back off, take take you know, take another look, and then and then after the guy shoots, they fire. Now I'm I'm one of those people that tries to be reasonable about these things because it's easy to sit in our chairs and say this should have happened or this would have happened yeah. or if this didn't happen, then it's obviously a lie because reality is much messier than that, much yes. messier. And I'm willing and I'm willing to 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 say to the – because that was a police sniper on the roof, wasn't it? It wasn't a Secret Service Apparently sniper. he was wearing oh, a police know. vest, but I think he was Secret Service. I, okay. He, yeah, I think those he are a, usually okay, – so, Secret Service, so, I believe, provides their own counter sniper team. Yeah. I, okay, so like, what I can – But so you're right. He had a police I, sign I am willing, on, his, on his whatever vest he had on. I am willing. I am willing to to admit the human condition that this guy could have seen a figure crawling or lying prone on the roof, not seen a rifle, decided to to make sure he wasn't shooting some bystander or something like that. Hesitated for a second. The guy pops up and, and takes the shots and so on. But but in any event, the the bottom line is there's simply no way that 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 roof should not have been. Yeah. There should have yes. been armed personnel yes. on that roof, uh, and and there's no way around that. Let me let me say a, a couple of things about that. One, I read uh, this kind of surprised me, although maybe it shouldn't have about Secret Service protocol, which is because you don't want to shoot an innocent person. Yes, uh, their protocol is for the counter snipers; they don't shoot first. The first thing is you you move the the primary away and you get say them gun to and safety. get them covered. Exactly. Uh, the yeah. other thing is you want to talk about accountability. This comes from uh, Secret Service Director Kim Cheadle, who, of course, is DIA approved and obsessed on why there is nobody stationed on that. You mean on that DEI? Uh, uh, no, D-I-E, die. I, I said it correctly. <laughs> um, okay. this, this is an exact quote. She said, that building in particular has a sloped roof at its highest point. And so, yeah. you know, there's a safety factor that would be considered there that no. we wouldn't want to put somebody up on a sloped roof. That, I don't believe that for a second. I heard her well, say that too. Hey, Scott, That's... in all fairness, maybe they were wearing heels. <laughs> Gentlemen, can I, can I just check something in here? Of course. Uh, for reasons beyond my control, I'm about to run out of drive space. Can we just put, put a quick pause? The audience won't notice it. We'll pick it right sure. back. Yeah, we don't stop recording, right? You keep going. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that, folks. All done. So um, Secret Service, uh, uh, you know, incompetence and, and I mean, gross incompetence, criminal incompetence. We, you guys were talking about the sloped roof thing. I mean, you want to just recap that again? <laughs> yeah, in fact, I was, I was just looking at a picture, Steve, of the roof of that building that uh, Director Cheadle said that it was, uh, it was too steep to have somebody up on that roof. And there are two FBI agents just standing erect on top of that roof. Um, now, now, because of where I live in Texas, we have a lot of hailstorms here, so I get to see a lot of roofers. I've never seen anybody looking that relaxed on a rooftop as those two FBI agents who were just standing there chatting with each other. For her to so, say, for her to say yeah. that we can't put people up there because of the slope of the roof, you know that that to me, again, I'm I'm a, look. I, I, the only reason I keep saying I'm a reasonable guy is because is because life has slowly and steadily beaten the stupid out of me, and I have found myself in situations where things are more complex than they seem to be. And I, and so I'm willing to let people, I'm willing to give somebody a mistake. I'm not willing to forgive this this lack of security. Don't get me wrong on this, right? But but a lot of times you don't know that you've made a mistake until you make the mistake. But in this particular sure. case, for this person to have committed this, the Cheadle, for this person to have committed this horrific, horrific um, malfeasance of duty, 
to come out and claim that, oh, no, we were going to put people up there, to just plain outright lie. That's what she needs to be fired for, if nothing else, right? Just for that alone. This, to me, is like and with, um, it, and with it, a judge, a Justice Jackson saying, well, I'm not a biologist, uh, Senator. I couldn't tell you what a woman is. You know, it's like yeah. I may disagree with you about your policies and, and still, uh, you know, uh, uh, vote to have you um, – you know, appointed to the bench. But if you're going to lie to me like this, if you're just going to lie to my face because you don't like the answer, then no, goodbye. I mean, to her if, credit, if she Cheadle said the buck stops with her. But yeah. I think the next thing out of her mouth should have been, we're, we're asking the president to send in a third party investigative agency to find out what happened here. Uh, no, and because instead we I'm, got excuses. Because yeah. I'm in the chain of command. You know, like the director should have said, I'm in the chain of command here. Therefore, I'm potentially at fault in this situation. Obviously, I'm ultimately responsible in this situation. And so we need an outside investigative agency to come in here and interview everybody and study the site and find out where the failures well, well, were, because clearly there were failures. Speaking if, of outside if agencies, Cheadle, just, oh, just let, me, quick, let me put this in real quick. Oh, no, okay, you go, go, no, ahead, no, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. No, no, after you. If Cheadle had the character required by the position she holds, nobody would have to fire her. She would have tendered her resignation on yeah, Monday morning. Here, you know, when, when shortly after Trump drove away, I thought, man, you know, the risk that you take as a public figure is unbelievable. And then, and then I thought, you know, I'll bet you the two people with the biggest targets on them, on the, at least in America and probably on the planet, well, no, Vladimir Putin would be number one in this case, but number two and three in terms of the uh, on the the list of people who assassins are coming after would be Donald Trump and Elon Musk. And my thought was, I, I have I have in, completely independent of the Trump assassination attempt, I've been genuinely concerned about Elon's safety because he's upsetting a lot of apple carts. And and the only thing I comfort myself with is the idea that the richest man in the world probably can afford some pretty good security. And and I was comforted by the fact that just by coincidence, apparently, uh, Musk had come out strong for Trump just a few days before the assassination attempt and, and, and started writing checks to back him and, and officially endorse him in, in, the, in the minutes after the, the bullets, but, but was basically on Team Trump. And I thought to myself, I don't, I don't trust the government to protect the man who's going to come in and dismantle the government. Uh, I don't. Wow. And, and, and I want... I want the people that are protecting Elon Musk. I want, I want professionals who are not all wrapped up in the DEI thing. And let me say something about the DEI thing. And I and I feel that this is balanced. This is this is evidence from my own personal eyeballs of watching the events. So I don't need verification of this. I saw three images uh, about the Secret Service, the the ones that were actually on top of Trump, the the, the ones in the black suits, the traditional Secret Service people. I saw three images. I'll give you the good one first. In the iconic photograph of Trump with his fist in the air and the flag in the background, his chest cavity is being protected by a woman. She is, there's a woman there who's, who is basically providing herself as, as, his, as his body armor. Black jacket, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, so that, is, that is courage and that is, and that is, um, that is a, a dedication ex- to duty. Dedication. That's the word I was looking for. Dedication to duty. I don't mean to take a single thing away from that woman at all. She's doing everything that she's supposed to do, and 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 she's a hero, and she deserves our our thanks and our and our yes. and our acclaim. I saw a second photograph from the side of a woman Secret Service agent who was cowering behind the other Secret Service agents in fear. And don't tell me that was anything other than that, because that's exactly what she was doing. And then I saw a third Secret Service agent as they were as they were getting Trump to the to the limo. She turns around. She's got a gun in her hand. She tries to holster the gun, can't holster it. She's 50 pounds overweight. She's fumbling around with the gun, decides to keep the gun. This is not the crack squad of, 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 of elite professionals that I've come to expect from the, from, the, from the Secret Service. And so, yes, this director had made, made it a, a priority to have, was it 30%, Steve, that she said she wanted as a target for Secret Service agents to be female? Uh, during her term, yeah, but she's going for 50% by, I think, 2030. Okay, well, let me just say this about that. I want to. I want people to remember what I said about that first agent. That first agent was was courageous and 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 brave and loyal and doing her duty. But even with that said, she was a small woman, 
And when she was covering the front of Trump, there was a lot of area exposed. This is a man's job. This is a job for big men. Or a and big woman's job, at least. <laughs> well, I, I am not convinced that they have the physical strength to do this. That woman, the, that one woman did a great job. The other two panicked. And, and this idea that we have to have 50% Secret Service agents being female is the same thing as saying we have to have 50% of our SEAL teams being female as well. And it's just not true. It's just ridiculous. It's, it's absurd and ridiculous. This is a man's job. The reflexes are quicker. They're bigger. They're stronger. They can take more punishment and damage. And I don't believe that women have any position in that aspect of, of the Secret Service. The, the immediate protective detail. The immediate and, protective yes. detail. And but speaking uh, more broadly of of that of that crew that that we saw do some great things as you said and some not so great things as as we all saw, we really had the uh, C players protecting the A target, and you can't do that. Well, now we get to the now we get to the part of of the discussion where. It's not necess- it's not necessarily a conspiracy like Joe Biden sits in a in a dark oval room with chairs that lead to trap doors with sharks underneath saying we got to take him out. Now we get to things like legislators saying we should eliminate the um, Secret Service protection for Donald Trump because he's a convicted felon. What? Th- th- I'm not making that up. That's that's an actual. Yeah, it was eight or ten event. Democrats that uh, sponsored that bill, which fortunately went nowhere. Okay, but but well, my to, point to is, President Biden's credit, he he's actually added security coverage for Robert Kennedy's candidacy too. Now. Yeah, finally, so, Kennedy yeah, requested him, it like five or six times. Took him a long time to get there, and especially and since he's Trump, a Kennedy, you would think that they would be right on that, but. And didn't Trump ask for? Didn't the Trump campaign yeah, ask for more Biden service and have it declined? Yeah, Biden after Trump said, "Hey, you got to get you got to get some protection for RFK Jr. Yeah, here." Yeah. No, no, yeah. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about for for Trump himself. Didn't the Trump didn't the Trump campaign request more Secret Service protection than they were getting and have it declined by the um, White House? That that one's still up in the air. Uh, I've I've seen both sides of that story, and I haven't seen anything definitive. So. All right, so we'll call that we're, speculation we're early at this point. days here still, yeah. Fair I, enough. I think that there's a legitimate debate to be had over whether, like you just, all the issues you just brought up about how and whether women can serve in, in the Secret Service. Um, I think when we get to this particular incident, I'm not willing to make judgments based on snapshots and video snippets uh, from this thing. Because I want to see, I want to see the case made. I want to see the evidence brought forth. I want to be able to see what okay. actually happened. Because I'm still going on the assumption that I think I know more than I really know. Now I made snap judgments too when I looked at videos and pictures of various kinds during the that I've seen since Saturday. But I also dialed myself back and said, "No, wait a minute. I think I know more than I really know, and I'm willing yeah. to let." the time play out. There's no imminent danger. And my opinion on this is not going to change the course of history. So I'm willing to let that play out in a court of law or in an investigative process, or even God forbid, a congressional hearing. Well, other you know, people have a... pointed out that at the convention floor uh, last night, um, Donald Trump was not, uh, Donald Trump was surrounded by, you know, eight men who were six foot four and, and, uh, this, this, this to me is just common sense. I mean, there's, there's nothing magical about this. The Secret Service guy should be at least as tall as the person that they're protecting. And I'm talking about, again, the immediate detail, the guys who make the, the, the turtle around the president right. in people times of crisis are, and then literally out. carry him away. Yes. But I do, I do think that this, and I hope anyway, that this is going to result in a top to bottom analysis of how we conduct these processes, the whole perimeter system. Is it adequate to say in all situations that local law enforcement can handle the more distant elements of that perimeter? Yeah, Given the fact that long range rifles can shoot literally hundreds of yards with relative accuracy in the hands of a skilled uh, marksman. And, and from this distance, you don't even have to be as skilled as that. But, but, but the, but the perimeter, but the perimeter at the, the case in Butler, the, the, the Secret Service perimeter is is like this, and then there's a big indentation where the roof is. You know, it's yeah. it's like there, there's no there's no. It's incomprehensible. I will agree. It's incomprehensible. Yes, it's incomprehensible yeah. Yeah. to see this as an accident or an oversight. It no, it, it's possible to think of it as stupidity, as an oversight. 
as an accident, as a lapse of judgment. It doesn't necessarily say somebody said, hey, why don't we leave that roof open so Junior Sniper Boy can climb up there, who normally works as a dietitian in a senior citizen center and at, at the age of 20 and can climb up there and do that. Um, you know, I, but, I, it is, but it is irregular enough for you. It is irregular enough for you to be able to raise that as a legitimate question. Oh, absolutely. I want to know, you know, oh, what I, was yes. the thinking of the people in charge of that site security when, and the with regard who had to a that gun building? Pointed at him? What's that? Who, who, and, and the policeman who climbed the roof and who backed down when somebody pointed a rifle at him, which is not an unreasonable thing to do. Sure. Although it's not particularly heroic either when you think about it. Um, the, well, when you've got your hands on the ladder and you're poking your head up, um, you really don't. You, uh, I'm not sure you, you got to get down before you can even draw. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My point is, <laughs> my point I mean, is, you have to get down. To my point is, if somebody on a roof points a rifle at me and I'm in law enforcement and the man is on the stage speaking, I am going to get the signal out there pretty quick. Yes, you and, shout. And, and if gun. I have to fire rounds into the air to yeah. do it, then that's what I'm going to do. And, and right now, we don't know that How that you didn't that? happen. <laughs> well. So the, I think there are a lot of things that we don't know about that process. So, right. you know, we we don't know that the guy didn't fall back on the ground and immediately grab his radio and say, hey, there's a gunman on the roof. Um, so we don't, we really don't know what happened there. Um, it but is, it, 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 I, it's the other phenomenon, the psychological phenomenon, I think, is not only do we all think we know when we see just a snapshot of things, we also think that we would have had the courage to do something better. Like, I think that. About myself. I, I, you, you'll I, in, notice. In every one of those situations, I think, well, I would have done better than that. And then I have to stop myself and go, wait a minute, you egotistical jackass. Oh, what hold you, on. <laughs> you've not really done just anything for, like that. Just for the record, you'll notice I did not at any point say no, that no. guy should have drawn his gun and gunned him no. down. I said, no. if I see a guy point a gun at me and I fall off a ladder, first thing I'm going to say is, ow. Second thing I'm going to yeah. say is gun or shooter. Yeah, and I'm yeah. not addressing and, you with this. I'm just saying I've okay. seen so much chatter from you know uh, armchair experts who believe that they knew that they e that they would have done the right thing. I would contend that even people who have been in the military or in police service, in you know, and in different situations, will acknowledge in their honest moments that they have made mistakes. That well, they the have universal, done. absolutely. We're all human. Yeah. Universal games. comment. The universal comment from people who've been under fire is that nobody knows how they're going to behave until they're under fire. Exactly. And that's what we learned and, about Trump. And, on and Saturday that's why afternoon. I'm willing and that's why I'm yeah, pr precisely correct. And that's why I'm willing to allow for um in incompetence, hesitation. I'm willing to allow for all of these things, but but you cannot escape the shocking absolutely shocking malfeasance on the part of the secret service with this and there's no yeah. and there's no way to explain that. It's 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 it isn't that the counter sniper didn't take the shot. It's that there it, it was known pretty quickly. Well, not pretty quickly. It, it, it was known. It was seen that there is there is a gunman there, my, and my the not, president wasn't immediately removed. No, my issues my issues not got anything to do with even the counter sniper taking the shot. My issue is is that a rooftop with a slant that would hide a sniper a hundred and fifty feet away or is one hundred fifty yeah. yards? Why I can wasn't never it covered? Uh, under fifty. Why yards. there weren't Why yeah. there weren't people on that roof? That's Right there, yeah. let's not get let's not get carried away with any other hypotheticals. And, that is and the, the president was apparently an hour late getting to the stage, so it's not like they were rushed. Like he didn't show up earlier than expected. There was plenty of time no, to get everything staged. On campaign trail. There yeah. are reports of people saying that there were signs of this guy prior to him being on the roof that people were aware that there was a man in the crowd with a gun 25 minutes before the shots were fired. Yeah, I've seen some of those headlines that now indicate that that some officials were aware of a potential threat guy in the in the crowd or somewhere on the property um, then up the to a half an hour beforehand. Then the speaker does not come to the podium. Yeah, yeah that mystifies yeah, and so, me. And so I can't wait to uh, see the investigation that results from this because they've got a lot of splaining to do, as you said. They have a lot of splaining to do. Yeah. And the the only thing, the literally the only thing that mitigates any of this is that they're going to be conducting that investigation over a live, hopefully sitting president uh Yes. Instead of over a over a casket. Or a casket. Yeah. And and just to to set the record straight here, I'm sure we don't even have to say this to people who know us. Um, but I don't care who was behind that podium. I don't care whether that was a Democrat rally or a Republican rally 
or Robert F. Kennedy or anybody else up there. This is not about we love Donald Trump and therefore we don't want him to get shot. This is about well, we don't doing want, we, the it's job sickening. It's, to protect. That's right. I can't imagine uh, if the president of the United States, the sitting president, had been that same position. Uh, for whatever I think of all his wrongheaded policies, if that guy had been shot at, I'd be upset as I am now. So let me let me just come out and say what you're saying. The three of us upset. Come out and we'd say be what in we're saying. Near civil if, war. If Joe, if this had been Joe Biden, and Joe Biden, uh, my reaction would be exactly the same. If Joe yes. Biden would have been shot by a sniper or Barack Obama, for that matter, mm -hmm. that would have been a national tragedy. That would have been a loathsome, re reprehensible is catastrophe to this country. Yes. There is no way that you can have a, a society that is an open society and 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 say I don't mind if we shoot their guy. I just think it sucks when they shoot ours. Yeah. Any kind no, of these attempts have to be 100% 100% full-throated absolutely condemned and anything And there less would have been that, no dark jokes on our part about better accuracy no, on the part missed, of the gunmen. No. Oh god. It would have no. been a catastrophe. And and by the way, this 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 bears mentioning. This this entire event once again reinforced my sense that I'm proud of the team to be on, that I'm on. Yeah. You know, because when we, I, re, I I recalled I mentioned this before, guys. I remember the three of us sitting there before we did the segment on Ruth Bader Ginsburg being incapacitated and yeah. not being able to serve in the court, and the three of us saying before the cameras were rolling. Not not for the benefit of the of the of the media matters watchers. Just the three of us together saying, "I hope she's okay. I hope she makes a recovery. I hope she retires. She's done a lot of damage to this country. Disagree with her completely, but I don't want this woman to die. I don't no. want I don't want these things to happen to these people, no. and and it's not it's not a hundred percent to zero percent, but there clearly is a difference between how the left and the right reacts to these kind of things, and and I'm just really really proud of of the kind of thing that we just said and, and the kind of sense that, that I've seen from virtually all conservatives that is that this, this is as reprehensible as, as if, it had been, if it had been somebody completely different on the podium. You and know? you know what? I, I, I can actually prove with something that I wrote almost 20 years ago now that this is not something we just say about the other side, but something I, I actually wrote. When... Saddam Hussein was hung up. I mean, he was executed. Um, I wrote at the time that this is a horrible man who I I wanted seen brought up on a on a tribunal like we had at Nuremberg and then hung. But the way it happened, and this is what I wrote, he was a victim of sectarian violence in Iraq because that's exactly what it was. Yeah. He deserved to be hung, but not like that. It wasn't justice. One gang of Iraqis got hold of him and strung him up. That was gang violence. That wasn't justice. That's what I wrote at the time. I took heat for it. But there's your evidence right there, as old as it is. That these aren't just something we, we say to be nice on, in, in theory or to if this cover were to ass. happen. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'd, I'd like to deal for at least a couple of minutes with something that has been heavy on my heart since uh, Saturday. Um Corey Comparatori, father of two from yeah. Sarver, Pennsylvania, covering his family with his body, was shot and killed uh, by this sniper. And he was an engineer, he was a volunteer firefighter, um, and, and he couldn't have been more excited to be there. He is now dead. David Dutch, age 57, and James Copenhaver, age 74, were, were seriously wounded in critical condition in a Pittsburgh hospital, last I read. Um, and not only do we grieve for their families and, and pray uh, for the healing of the guys who are still uh, injured, um, but I, I want to draw attention to Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro, um, who's a Democrat, who um, made a public statement about Corey Comparatori and said, it said in the uh, Washington Post, Shapiro described Comparatori as a firefighter, a churchgoer, and a proud girl dad. He was so excited to attend the rally, Shapiro said. Friends were following his posts on Facebook from the event. This is a Democrat governor, says, Corey was the very best of us, Shapiro added during the news conference. 
He ordered all flags at state government buildings to fly at half staff in recognition of the tragedy and to honor Comparatory's memory. He also extended prayers on behalf of all Pennsylvanians to the two injured men and their families. This is a Democrat governor recognizing the joy that a man going to a Trump rally was experiencing and the tragic loss of this great man who had run into buildings to save people's lives as a volunteer fighter, firefighter for years and who dove on his family to protect their lives. I thought that was an exceedingly gracious thing for a Democrat governor to say, and I'm glad it was bereft that was, that was pitch of perfect. politics. And, and, and Corey Capitore, everybody leaves this earth. Everybody leaves. Nobody stays. Yeah. Everybody has an exit and an exit line and an exit scene. And Corey Capitore was 50 years old when he left this planet. But nobody has gone out better than that man did protecting his family. This, this term hero, it's the two terms that are just bandied about so often that they've yeah. lost all their meaning. One is hero and the other is genius. But this, this is the, – see, I don't even – on some level and, – and I think most people who, who've been uh, recognized for heroism will tell you this – that this is not like a conscious decision on their part. Like, I must do something heroic. This there are shots he fired. He he dives on top of his wife and, and girls and covers them with his arms and takes the bullets that were meant to hit them. The only comfort I find at the loss of a man like this is that is that it was entirely possible that Corey Capitori could have could have escaped from that uh, uh, a rally and then and then been hit by a bus. And that's how a lot of people go out. But, but what this or man spend did, the remainder of his years grieving the loss of his wife or daughter, because he, he couldn't. He has because a, he didn't he has, do there, that. Now there's a widow and two and two girls without a dad, but they will always have a dad. Those two girls, they'll always have a hero for a dad, and it doesn't. Not many people get the opportunity to prove their love for their family to the degree that Corey Compatori did, and. On some level, in that regard, he was a very lucky man. Uh, His colleagues he, in the volunteer firefighter said that he was typically the first guy in. First guy to in, a burning last building. guy out. Damn. And and this is and this and this is the kind of person that goes to these kind of rallies, and this is the kind of working person who's not a movie star. He's not not famous, he's not glamorous, he's not well-connected, he's just an everyday American hero, and, and he's killed for, attempting, uh, for attending a political rally at a candidate who's been demonized as Hitler and, and the end of our democracy and, and all the rest of it, and we might want to talk about that a little bit. The one thing I've said from the beginning, and, and, and this precedes the Trump assassination by a wide margin, Attempt. if we, uh, we can say, thank you, the, thank you, we can say, and be honestly say, that that the rhetoric that has been leveled at Donald Trump has been so uh, erroneous, so offensive, so agitating that it that increases the risk to his life. There's no question. We I, I think there's no question about that. But to say that the rhetoric caused the assassin to pull the trigger is a, we have to stop short of that point because if we don't. We Rhetoric lose. did not make him into a killer. Correct. Because if we don't stop there, if we say, no, this was caused by the MSNBC rhetoric, or this was caused by Biden saying, put him in the bullseye. If we say it was caused by that, then we all have to amend our speech to say things that we w that the craziest person in the country will not be uh, offended by or, 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 or triggered by. Agitated is the word you use. And I think that is Spot on, and, and so and so, our speech has to be amended to make sure that the most volatile, insane person in our society is not agitated by what we say. And, and furthermore, it cannot be done, even if it and, can be and done. no. And furthermore, no. It, it no. not only not only do you give up freedom of speech and freedom of thought, but you also give up the entire idea of individual responsibility. This yeah. individual is responsible for pulling that trigger, and no one else. And and, and sometimes and people don't that, want to hear that. 
when when uh, earlier and I said that you know how is it possible that the actions of a somewhat deranged twenty year old could suddenly you know change the tenor of the country? It doesn't. Fundamentally, this country is still a bunch of people who agree and disagree and argue and fight and love each other and play sports together and and cheer for the same teams and cheer for different teams and and go to church together. We are fundamentally the same country even though this jackass climbed up on a building and popped off a few rounds in the direction of a presidential candidate and darn near killed him. It, it is not a fundamental statement about this country. Our reaction to it in many ways is a demonstration of how we are able to carry on such a crazy experiment in Republican democracy for so many years without killing each other. Um, and 43 years without, without bullets yeah. flying is is quite a streak. You know, I was, uh, we, you know, and this is something for people, oh, Americans are so, uh, American politics so so infested with, with violence. It's like, no. we have more guns than people in this country, and we've yeah. gone 43 years without bullets being being fired at a, at a, a political, at a president anyway. Yeah. Um, and, um, and that's a pretty low failure rate. Let me uh, let me show you share something with you from uh, the Washington Examiner on uh, on Monday. It was a, a snippet of inter- of an interview with Trump who who had who had said to the Washington Examiner guy, "You'd recognize his name if I could remember it." He said, "I'm not supposed to be here." Was kind of his summation of surviving that assassination attempt. And he said, it was obvious that Trump was still processing what had happened. Who wouldn't be? It is something that will stay with him for the rest of his life. At the moment, he's grappling with the feeling that something very big has changed in his life and in the presidential race. When I asked him, does this change your campaign? He immediately answered, yes. Trump explained that before Saturday night, he had finished the speech he planned to give later this week at the Republican convention. That's going to be Wednesday night. I'll be live blogging it over at PJ Media. Trump said, I basically had a speech that was an unbelievable rip roar. It was brutal, really good, really tough. Last night, I threw it out. I think it would be very bad if I got up and started going wild about how horrible everybody is and how corrupt and crooked, even if it's true. Had this not happened, we had a speech that was pretty well set that was extremely tough. Now we have a speech that is more unifying. After all the rhetoric, after the bullets flew, Trump decided to give up this red meat speech. And I bet it was going to be some really tasty red meat. I, I, I like a good red meat speech. And instead, it sounds like he's decided to do something... Uh, more Reagan, more happy warrior, transcendental. Uh, this this can be an amazing thing. I don't usually look forward to political speeches very much. I've just I've seen too many of them over the years. I'm I'm a little jaded. I'm sorry to say. Wednesday night, I'm excited for this acceptance speech. Me too. I was you know there's kind of surprised. I saw um, some coverage of the speeches that were given um, Monday night. And after the president actually kind of came in by surprise, uh, the former president, and, and sat down with his family and was watching um, some of these speeches, and he was sitting next to J.D. Vance, his, his vice presidential pick, um, and Tucker Carlson was actually in that same row, and then there was a, a congressman or senator whose name escapes me that was a, a potential uh, VP pick was there with him as well. And I don't know if I've ever seen... This sounds weird, but it's like such a peaceful calm. look. It was calm. It was serene. It was like he was happy, and yes, um, and at then, peace. and I, and it was just. But it was not like a. It was not a triumphal kind of thing. It was just like he seemed relaxed and pleased to be there and and touched. Uh, I mean, when he first came out, you could see he got a little choked up, um, as did one of his sons, um, and it was really. It was really striking to see that that look on his face, and you know, for those of us who've been praying, it, it's humanizing. He's for such years. a larger than life guy, and ju- it's just. Um, I think you can't help but go through something like this, and and it have an impact on you. Um, and I hope he's successful in in that unifying thing. I know that on that opening night of the convention. There were a few surprises. They had a they had a uh, a YouTube influencer I'd never heard of whose name is Amber Rose, um, who is I think she's like at least partially African American or something. I I couldn't really make it out. Apparently she's famous and I don't know her, 
But she got up and she basically said, in, in summary, I wasn't on this team. I thought uh, because people had told me so that Trump was a racist. And then I got to see for myself that he wasn't. And now I'm on this team. So, I mean, I'm, that was a very brief summary of her excellent speech. No, but it's... Yeah. And then... It was a moving what was, speech. What was even more startling was for the first time in history, the president of the Teamsters Union got up and got a big chunk of time to speak in front of the Republican National Convention. He didn't get up to give an endorsement of Donald Trump, and he didn't say things that were necessarily going to be cheered all the time, although many of the things he said were cheered. He came down pretty hard on big business and Chamber of Commerce and stuff like that. He was very strong in his defense of, of unionism. And I thought, what a, what a calm sense of confidence a, a party has to invite that guy to stand up in front of their delegates, many of whom will disagree with what he says, and to let him have free speech in front of those people to say whatever he wants when he's not there to endorse. But what he did say basically was, nobody's ever let me do this before. You know, this is this is here huge. I am. This is beyond. This yeah. is incredibly huge. Uh, just, uh, before, because I'd like to address that, but I just want to say one thing about Trump's changed mood and 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 maybe changed spirit. Because I, I agree with you, he looked different. He looked different. His face was different. It was almost placid. And it was like yes, it was, yeah. I don't know how to. It's serene. It. Yeah, it was serene. Yeah. There's there's something in in metallurgy called a fire assay, and a fire assay is when you're trying to determine the purity of a metal. You have to you have to melt it, you you have to basically heat it red hot and melt it. You have to transform mm. it essentially, in order to find out its purity. And the term fire assay has often been used, uh, at least in the 18th century, uh, 19th century, uh, to um, to reference uh, uh, the idea that a traumatic event can can show you not only the essence of who that character is, what the what the metal it separates the the precious metals from the base metals, yeah. but also also changes the person as well. You know, it does it does separate the gold from the lead. From the dross, uh, Trump yeah. could use Trump could use some could use less lead. I don't for a minute think that means he's going to stop fighting, but but you can see a, a, a potential where Trump 2.0 is a very different guy than Trump 1.0 as a result of this assassination attempt. And and I don't see him backing down on any of his principles, but he might be far, far, far more effective at getting them um, implemented if he if he shows a little more gold and a little less lead, you know? I think he um I think he he realizes I mean this is just projection, but I get sure. the sense that he realizes something that we all most of us do not realize. It's true for all of us all the time, but he just had a hinge moment where you suddenly realize, wait a minute, not one day is guaranteed. I'm not supposed to be here. Is Every powerful? day is a yeah. gift. Every, you know, and to be able to sit in uh, among these people and listen to these speeches and hear the praise of people and applause, and that's all really nice, but to just be alive to be seated with his daughter and his sons to be you know or or his his friends to to have that opportunity and I, and I think if that that may have done more than any attempts by the sitting president of the United States to try to to, to calm people and to say hey there's no place for this in in American public um, and I I've seen also that the commentators are immediately coming after the vice presidential pick because they say well he picked the most abrasive possible, you know, choice. He didn't try to to moderate and go to the middle more. He picked J.D. Vance, the Ohio senator. Um, I first became aware of J.D. Vance when I read Hillbilly Elegy, Fine which book. Vance wrote before he got into politics. And I just saw an interview with uh, Megyn Kelly, who she did that she did some time ago before J.D. Vance had a beard. And this was before he ran for politics. In fact, in that interview, he, th she said, well, a lot of people are saying J.D. ought to go into politics. And he was just kind of laughing at the notion. He's like, well, you know, you never say never. But, I, you know, why would I do that, basically? Um, but he, he, this guy 
is, you know, grew up in a horrible circumstance with an addict mother and abuse and, you know, living in a poor kind of rust bucket town, uh, wound up being cared for by his grandmother living in the Appalachia. So this guy has lived at kind of a, a, the, the base level of American survival with a lot of trauma in his life. And he said, uh, they, she, uh, Megyn Kelly said, well, how did you think that you could go to Yale Law School? And he said, I actually read a paper that talked about the fact that so many children who have grown up in abusive situations are kind of stuck in their minds believing they're not worthy of anything, but really there's no difference in their mental capacity between them and anybody else. And he said, for some reason, that just like threw a switch for him. And he was like, hey, maybe I'm not as pathetic as I thought I was. You know, maybe I could. He went to Ohio State and then he went to Yale and, you know, yeah. to get and a that, law degree. By the way, he signed up for the Marines after 9-11. Yeah, yeah. He has the ability. And and it, I mean, it's not just him because, as you mentioned, the, we had a union uh, chief speaking at a Republican National Convention. But the, it's too late for them to do anything about it. The Democrats have lost the working men. And that's not just losing a voting block. That's their brand. That's their brand identity gone. The Democratic Party, throughout, throughout at least throughout modern history, has, ever since I've been aware of the word Democratic Party, has brand has been, we're the party of the little guy. We're the party of the working man. We're the party who's going to protect the regular Joe Joe Paycheck against you know depredations by these billionaires. And now the Democratic Party is the party of billionaires and tech giants and all the rest of it. And, and so neurotics. Party, uh, and, 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 and elitists and, and people who want to social engineer the kind of things that the regular working blue collar guy wants nothing to do with. He doesn't want uh, some guy competing with his daughter in, um, in, uh, in sports, in, in, in her high school track meets or, or whatever. Or in the they, locker room. If they, if they, uh, and I believe it's already happened, I believe it's too late. If, if the Democratic Party loses the little guy, the working man, then they've not just lost their, their, uh, uh, their main block. They've lost their entire identity. They've lost their soul. They said that and I'd um, be there are more five, than happy to welcome those people. There are five black Republican congressmen, apparently. Four of them are slated to speak at the convention. Wow. So, okay. you know, it's, it looks like the, the, the Trump organization and, you know, in large part, RNC is part of the Trump organization now, but um, that they're really making an intentional effort to make inroads with groups that have at least felt like they were being marginalized uh, by Republicans or that Republicans didn't care about them. And they're making a very intentional effort to give prominence to these people and and let them... And it's working. I, 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 and, I'd rather and, see more direct campaigning in places that Republicans yes. haven't campaigned in 50 or 60 years. 50 or 60 years rather than just, you know, putting somebody on TV for five or 10 minutes. Yeah. Step um, in the right direction. Keep it up. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll, we'll see so. how that goes. And Van, what struck me about Vance and after watching this interview and seeing some other things about him, I was like, you know, they, they treat uh, him in the media as if he's some sort of raving wolf of a, you know, like a, a nasty <laughs> predator and he's sitting across from Megyn Kelly, and she's like, well, you know, um, what do you think of all this? And he goes, I, uh, I, I don't believe it. And she goes, well, what do you mean? And he said, I'm sitting across from Megyn Kelly. <laughs> like, I'm being interviewed by Megyn Kelly. This is unbelievable to me. And at the end of the interview, she goes, um, you know, I got the sense from reading your book, Hillbilly Elegy, when I got to the end of it, that there were some things about your upbringing that you still have not dealt with. And when I talk to your sister, his sister's super protective of him. She's about five years older and she just loves him. She said she'd step in front of a truck for him and so would he, he would do the same for her. And he said, when I talk to your sister, she had the same perception that there are some things that you have just not dealt with. What do you think? And he said, basically, I, I think that's probably true. You know, it's like he, he's, he's, he's willing to be vulnerable. He's, he's been through a horrible situation. Like he's, he is the candidate that, that Democrats would have looked for. 
because he's he, he is somebody who has a story that connects with people and he the 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 hardest thing for politicians is he comes across as authentic and genuine. And uh, and not only that, my boy is wicked smart. Yeah, but now you now know, now he's literally Hitler Jr. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you something, Steve. Yeah. After, just during this conversation, the conversation about how Donald Trump appears changed and hit him openly admitting that he's throwing away the red meat speech, which he could have added extra red to, by the way. Oh, you know, yeah. The bloody sh- oh, he could put A1 sauce on there. Yeah. And, oh, so yeah, so yeah. him, him, so Donald Trump basically talking about changing his tone to a more unifying tone. And then you hear about the character of the vice presidential uh, nominee. And, and just in the course of the last 10 or 15 minutes of talking with you guys, I find myself feeling a strange sort of serenity about things, you know, not, not just, not just a, not just a lack of worry, just a, a, a a sense that something very, very big and powerful is happening right now. There are big, 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 big movements going on. That, and that, and that's that the feeling I got when I read that post. Washington Examiner piece that I quoted to you. What's that? Th- that's yeah. the feeling I got yesterday oh. when I first read that Washington Examiner piece that I shared yeah. with you. And I yeah. and my my kind of concluding thought about this at this point in time is kind of what I've said earlier is like uh, I don't want to I don't want to take a shallow a shallow evaluation of this moment. Um, I want to let this sit with me. I want to I want to better understand it. I know that there were some things that happened in the last few days that were profoundly moving and and impactful for anybody who saw them, um, except for a few you know people who can, just can't get out of their own way. Um, yeah. But I, I just, I hope, uh, I'll finish with this. I saw an, uh, a, a piece, um, I can't remember which news source it was in, but it was written by a guy whose name, it looked to be like an Arabic name. And he was a reporter who had gone to the Republican convention to cover it. And he expected uh, a kind of a really negative mood at the convention. And he was just kind of ready for that because he thought, my goodness, these people have just been through this a threat to their candidate and and uh, and all of that kind of stuff, and it's going to be pretty dark. And he said, going through security, the only um, awkwardness were sometimes people were a little impatient of, okay, let's let's get a move on. But he said it was almost like the people who were handling the security and the people who were waiting in line were cheerful. And he said, then I got inside, cheerful. and I. I, I went and asked people questions about the convention and stuff like that, and nobody brought up the assassination attempt. When I brought it up, they would express concern, great gratitude to God for, for the president's survival and things like that, but then then wanted to kind of move on to their overall good feeling about what was happening. The only person he ran into who brought up the topic of the assassination attempt at the RNC's arena was Madison Cawthorn, who's no longer in Congress. And uh, and he not only brought it up, but he had like a little tripartite slogan that he had clearly workshopped before he got there that he used to, to, to describe the situation. And, uh, and he sounded like a craven politician. I don't know anything about Madison Cawthorn, but... He he sounded like a craven politician. The writer was stunned that everybody else he ran into seemed like genuine, kind, happy people who were excited about the future of the country um, and and did not try to ride the assassination attempt for any kind of conspiracy theories or any kind of, of political advantage and, and didn't even bring it up on their own. Um, yeah. And that that was good to hear. Uh, Steve, I think that was the arena that we were all, or maybe not the same arena, but it was the city we were in for the convention in 08, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, no, it was, it was Minneapolis. Um, let me let me finish with just, just one last thought. It's actually very brief. Trump dodged a bullet on Saturday. The country dodged something far worse had the assassin succeeded, but that has given us a, a chance for something great yeah if if we can take it and i hope we do and i feel the wheel of history turning i can feel it 
not just an election, not just another cycle. I, I feel the wheel of history turning, and I, and I and I really like the way it feels, frankly. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we thank you to the members at uh, BillWhittle.com for making this program possible. Um, we usually do three episodes each week, plus a backstage episode for our members only. Um, if you've never explored membership at BillWhittle.com, you can go to BillWhittle.com and check that out. Uh, but even if you just watch us here at YouTube, we appreciate you doing that. Um, and we look forward to your ideas and suggestions and comments in the comments section. For Bill Whittle and Stephen Green, I'm Scott Ott. 